Uh, we have two items to cover tonight on our work session. The first one being the Washington County Supportive Housing Services Implementation Update. I'm looking for county staff. There's Jess. How are you, Jess and Heather? Good evening, Mayor. Well, uh, thank you. I'm well. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. Are you kicking it over to us right away? It's over to you. Ah, yeah. very good. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, counselors, mayor. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our update of the Supportive Housing Services Program in Washington County. My name is Jess Larson. Um, I use she and her pronouns, and I am the Department of Housing Services uh, Sur Supportive Housing Services Program Manager. And I'm joined by my colleague, Heather Scriver. Um, Heather, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Heather Scriver, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Supportive Housing Services Data Analyst. Great. And we have a brief presentation of 11 slides, I think, prepared. Uh, they're actually, it's 11 packed slides of uh, information uh, updating you about our implementation after about six months of work underway and um, and then hopefully enough time for you to ask us some questions at the end. Uh, does that sound about right, Mayor? And should I proceed with the presentation? Sounds good. Go ahead. Great. And should I be sharing the screen? Is that how your team would like us to do this or do you have the PowerPoint on your end? Um, it's great if you do. Um, we're we're happy to if something goes wrong. Great. I think I can do that. So I'm uploading the PowerPoint and I will put it in presentation mode. How does that look, Sherilyn? Great. Thank okay. You. You're so welcome. All right. So here's just our title slide, which we basically <laughs> introduced ourselves. Um, so we'll move on. Um, so just to some background on the Supportive Housing Services uh, measure itself, as you may recall, it was approved by voters back in May of 2020 um, with broad support across the tri-county region with 58% of voters approving it or, or supporting it. Um, and um, it was a concept prepared in partnership with a broad coalition of business and community leaders and um, was designed specifically to generate $200 million per year with the two new taxes that have since been enacted. Um, and it was scaled um, to this degree on purpose so that our region could achieve the goal of what is called functional zero in the rate of chronic homelessness across the region. What this would mean is that anybody who is at risk of chronic homelessness or is currently experiencing prolonged homelessness with condi disabling conditions would immediately be connected to housing-based services and a permanent housing placement um, to meet their needs. Um, so in order to build that capacity as a system to meet that community need, this measure was um, created. And to date, it is the largest per capita investment anywhere in the country designed to address homelessness. Um, before we get started with our um, updates of our programmatic implementation of this new game-changing um, measure, we want to describe how and why we're building this system of care. Um, so this gentleman, his name is Patrick. Um, he's standing with Hannah and Ben, um, and I don't know the dog's name. <laughs> Hannah and Ben are two uh, case managers at our Aloha in Bridge Shelter program, which you're going to hear a little bit more in the presentation ahead. And Patrick had been homeless outside with a disability for 15 years so long that he forgot how to live inside. And when his brother convinced him finally to seek help and access the shelter program, it took a long time for staff there to really convince him to stay. Um, and now thankfully he's gotten comfortable indoors. And in fact, so comfortable that he signed up for a permanent housing placement and has since left the shelter program and landed in permanent supportive housing where he'll continue to work with the case manager. 
And now, rather than you know worrying about can he live indoors, uh, Patrick is talking to his case managers about how he's excited to host his 12 grandchildren over to visit him in his new apartment. So that's the kind of transformative um, experience we're hoping for so many of our neighbors who've been stuck outside for long, prolonged periods of time and can relearn um, relearn how to live inside and get the supports they need to successfully transition to stable housing. So you're going to hear points of that story retold in the various programs that were necessary to make um, Patrick's housing stability possible. Um, and I'll pass it to Heather to start sharing some of those programmatic updates. Thank you, Jess. Um, the first program that we're going to talk about is actually that bridge shelter program that Patrick was involved in. And so this was our first SHS program that was launched. And um, this was a housing focused shelter program. And that means that everyone who is living in those shelters is connected to a housing resource and being provided housing case management services and housing navigation services to help connect these people into housing and help them actually find housing. Um, this is 102 new year-round shelter beds across three different uh, shelters. These are formal hotels that have been converted into non-congregate shelter. Um, so we have them in Hillsborough, Aloha, and Forest Grove Inn. The next program that we've been working on is the Housing Case Management Program, and this is going to be our primary way to um, get people housed into long-term services. Um, so in this program, our 17 service providers will provide housing placement and retention services to people who have experienced or are at risk of prolonged um, homelessness. These are also people who are extremely low income and have a disability or are um, older at being 55 plus. Um, these providers will be providing um, housing navigation and long-term support to make sure that people can remain stably housed after they are housed. And, um, all in all, this will be, we have enough slots for 800 participants. So each of those 17 providers will have two to three case managers. And those case managers will be working with 20 to 30 participants long-term indefinitely, as long as they need the support. And this should get us to our year one goal of 500 um, permanent supportive housing places placements. Um, this program is being launched with the Regional Long-Term Rental Assistance Program. Um, that program is was created in partnership with the three counties and with Metro Strack to provide permanent and uh, permanent rental assistance to extremely low income housing. Uh, we have referrals going on right now with the regional long term um, rental assistance, also called ARLA, and we actually had our first um, participant who was referred into that program get housed just a few weeks ago. So it was a very exciting milestone for our team. Um, in addition to those programs, we've been working on several system and equity investments. So the first being working on providing administrative um, support for programs that, for culturally specific programs so that way they can launch their um, programs. So we currently have four culturally specific providers that we've been working with so that way they can build out more culturally specific capacity. We've also launched a series of training programs um, so that we ranges from behavioral and health training series that includes harm reduction, de-escalation and crisis resource and training, uh, as well as training on cultural, how to provide culturally and trauma informed care. And then also some training around um, case management and housing navigation services. Another um, investment or process we put in place was the inclusive procurement process. So back in May, we launched a Request for programmatic qualification process. This was very well received and was viewed as being very inclusive and transparent. Um, and it resulted in a very diverse pool of 38 qualified service providers. So we have 38 organizations that are basically in our queue um, available to us to provide SHS programming. Um, and this process was seen as very successful and we are actually in the process of launching a new round of um, requests for programmatic qualifications and this time we're doing it as a region so with Multnomah County and Clackamas County going through a similar process using our uh, what we came up with. Um, the next investment that I'm going to talk about is our Community Connect modernization. So Community Connect is the coordinated entry system, how people enter into our world and how we um, begin to connect them with housing resources. We've revamped that process to streamline it and to help it be a lot more trauma-informed. Um, 
and just make it work more efficient and faster. So instead of it being a long drawn out assessment that we used to have, it is now you know, the minimal questions that you need to start figuring out how to help someone. And it's roughly 20 minutes. Um, can't remember exactly how many questions, but it's really short, really minimal, less invasive, more trauma informed. All right, now we'll go through the outcomes reports um, in our system baseline. So this is where we'll talk about some of the data and the numbers. And I did want to draw attention to, we should have a, a copy of the PDF of our first quarter report. So there's a lot more information around our metrics and our numbers in the appendix section. If you want more details, I'm gonna to try to keep it a little high level here. Um, as we're going through this, I think the, the main story we'll see is, um, because this report for our first quarter was really our system baseline. Where are we starting before we've really been able to implement SHS programs? Um, and so you'll see that the story here is really one of lack of capacity. Um, so starting with the program inflow and outflow, they had, we had about 840 households enter our system in the first quarter. And of that number, there's 278 who got assistance. Um, and the remainder, most of them either exited our system, um, which could be maybe that they were able to self, um, self correct and no longer needed services, or it could just be that they gave up and um, they couldn't get help. And we have about 172 that are still left waiting for services. The next metric would be our system capacity. Um, this is focused on our permanent supportive housing. We have about 900 households that we're aware of who need permanent supportive housing placements, and we only have just under 400 slots available. Um, and due to that limited capacity, we are only able to place six people into permanent supportive housing in our first quarter. Um, for in terms of how long people are being homeless and the, the length of time homeless, for all of those who were housed during the period, they had spent about one year um, homeless before they got into housing. For those who are still waiting for housing, they've been homeless for about two years. Um, and the next one is actually where I want to highlight a really positive thing about the way our system has been functioning, and that is that once people are housed or they get some sort of housing service, they've actually been able to retain housing um, with only 90, like, with 95% of our participants not returning to homelessness within two years. All right, the next one is the fund budget one. Um, so you'll see in the top left pie chart, that is our baseline um, funding. That is what we had you know, prior to this um, new bond measure, so 10 and a half million, um, mostly federal funding, a little bit of state funding, and then a little less on the local funding. In the bottom left graph, you'll see what that baseline looks like with the added um, COVID response funds, um, providing an additional 8 million to help us with those, you know, emergency short-term COVID funds. And then that graphic on the right is the pie chart once you add in the SHS programming. And you can just see um, how significant the impact is on our uh, ability to provide services once we get these additional dollars into the system. And now I'll pass it off to Jess, who will continue to talk about what we're doing next. Thanks, Heather. So looking ahead, as uh, we continue to roll out um, SHS programs to scale up um, our capacity to better meet our community need, we have some clear next steps in front of us. So first is creating permanent supportive housing placements. Um, you could see in some of those outcomes that we have a lot of backup, backup, backed up need in our community. And um, while we can create the case managers and the rent assistance, we also need to create the physical locations where people will be able to live with those wraparound services in place. So our first step is actually converting um, the Aloha Inn, which is currently being operated as a temporary shelter program into a permanent PSH program. Um, there'll be 50 unit uh, capacity for 54 permanent supportive housing placements there um, with all of those services on site to support folks like Patrick um, who are transitioning um, into permanent, uh, permanent housing. Um, but in addition to the Aloha Inn, we're looking for permanent supportive housing capacity all across the county. Um, and we've put out a funding opportunity for any owner of affordable housing that wants to set aside units 
dedicated to serve folks coming out of chronic homelessness being served by SHS uh, and um, and uh, uh, getting being ready to, to go into housing. Um, so we will partner with those owners of affordable housing for with as many units as they set aside, we can pair the case management services and the Arla rent assistance voucher to ensure the stability um, and the supports needed on site to serve those those folks. We're also expanding the work and role of our Homeless Plan Advisory Committee, also called HPAC, sorry, HPAC, um, because this is such a significant expansion of services in um, Washington County, we also need to expand the role of our oversight and um, kind of uh, our oversight committee that provides transparent accountability with the community to, to track our outcomes and make sure we're on track um, year over year to better uh, meet the needs of our community. And um, this uh, presentation was prepared a couple weeks back. Um, so it was talking about what's coming next. And actually this uh, slide represents what's in place right now. Um, so the winter shelter program launched on November 15th. We've had winter shelter programs in the past in Washington County. They've been slowly evolving over the years. Historically, they were um, often based in our um, uh, in uh, churches and other faith community settings, and the the locations might change from week to week or night to night. Um, and over the years, we've learned the um, benefit of providing a stable location night after night for participants in our winter shelter programs. Ultimately, we want to advance so that. Um, the advance the capacity of the system so we're not limiting shelter just to the coldest nights of the year it's available year round but in order to do that we need permanent locations so right now we're limited to locations that will get temporary um, permission to operate these winter shelter programs we have um three congregate settings, one at Just Compassion's um, Center in Tigard, one at the Community Center in Beaverton, and one at the Cloverleaf on the fairgrounds in Hillsboro. And then we have a variety of uh, locations distributed across various motels for 87 families and medically vulnerable households who can't stay in these congregate winter shelter capacity um, settings. Um, so these will be open at least through March 15th. And again, we're hoping to expand this shelter program capacity by extending it year round is our, our next goal. And I think that's here in our final slide, the SHS overall and year one goals. Um, so we, we've, um, we're on track to meet the supportive housing placements um, through the um, implementation of our HCMS programs and our ARLA program. We're next working out um, in the new year, we're working on building out programs that will address other households who are experiencing economic-based or short-term homelessness. That will be the 500 additional households. And then we've already met our first year goal of 100 new year round shelter beds with the bridge shelter programs, though, as you've heard, some of those bridge shelter programs are transitioning into permanent supportive housing. So we still need to work on building out that year round shelter capacity as a as a system when this program, the SHS program, you know, reaches kind of capacity when it's at full tax collection. Um, our goal is to get to 250 year round shelter beds and ultimately to be able to support 1,665 supportive housing placements. What that number represents is our Washington County portion of the overall regional goal to ach effectively achieve that net, um, that functional zero of chronic homelessness. And then finally, and fundamentally, in all of our program goals, we expect and we will hold ourselves accountable to measure, being able to measurely, dem uh, sorry, um, be able to demonstrate with measurable outcomes how we're advancing racial equity for those who are served and housing retention. So I think that's the last slide. And Mayor, we turn it back over to you. I'll stop sharing, but I'm happy to bring the slideshow back up if it's helpful um, to the counselors. Thanks, Jess and Heather. Uh, questions for Jess and or Heather. Uh, Councilor Pratt and Councilor <coughs> Stephen Sacco. 
Hi, Justin, Heather, and um, thank you for um, the presentation and all the good work you're doing with these funds. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you kind of answered my question, like you have a longer term goal to get to that 665 supported houses and then the 250 a year temporary housing. I'm wondering if um, every couple of years that's going to be re-looked at and you're going to look at the um, expected population growth to kind of adjust that for changes in our population. Excellent question, Counselor. Um, absolutely, our HPAC, that advisory body, will be a very important body and these conversations with our uh, partners and city councils and such to continually evaluate our program's outcomes and our goals. Are we on track to meeting the community need? Now, we are also going to be limited by the capacity of this resource. So if the need, if the region grows exponentially or the region's need grows, if there's... Um, tragic uh, uh, climate event that suddenly results in thousands more people experiencing homelessness that doesn't necessarily result in you know equivalent amount of resources to meet that need so we will be constrained by the resources but always adjusting to best meet the community need with those resources relying on our community advisory bodies especially Marco. thank you um I, I didn't quite understand exactly what um, specifically the cultural specific capacity building, what all that entailed. Um, so I was just wondering if you could go into that in a little bit more detail. Sure. Um, and, and Heather, feel free to add in. Um, so we have, um, for every culturally specific organization, and there's a statewide definition that determines which organizations uh, for organizations can kind of define themselves as culturally specific. And for every culturally specific organization that we enter into contract with, we necessarily understand that the capacity of that organization is probably historically limited by a limitation of resources. So we've made a commitment to do capacity building by way of a $50,000 administrative kind of grant to support that organization for three years so that they can build out the organizational infrastructure they may need to be able to effectively build these programs and support their participants. And this is a, a commitment of the measure to ensure that we have culturally specific resources scaled to meet the needs of our culturally specific community. So SHS has designed some of our programs to help build that capacity. And we're also creating a cohort to support the organization so we can better understand those you know, challenges they're facing and beyond those resources, strategize how the county can support organizational growth and um, stability among our culturally specific providers. Okay, other questions? I got a quick one. Um, Jess and Heather gave this presentation last month to the Washington County mayors and the concern the mayors had, and they've heard it, uh, is the capacity. I mean, Jess keeps saying the, the lack of capacity and the frustration some people are expressing with, um, you know, progress being made. And she did allude to, uh, you know, the, the Metro income tax that's going to fund this program. They haven't had full collections yet, uh, but you know, some of the numbers, you know, make people kind of stand back, like the, the example of people having to wait two years to get into housing with here we are spending, you know, Metro tax money for supportive housing and for supportive services. And, uh, you know, people still have to wait for two years. So I, but I know that's the frustration and some of the limitations that we have in the initial year of this program. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you're both uh, addressing the capacity issue because that's what keeps coming up is why there's still people on the streets, why, you know, what's going on. And it's just right now there's, a, you know, there's a lack of capacity where to put them, uh, how to place them if they need mental health support, any other kind of support. So uh, we, you know, my hope is we can get this built out faster <laughs> uh, as the tax dollars come in uh, because like you said, mentioned 58% of people vote for this looking for a program that will get those folks off the street and get the help they need. And uh, we just got to see how long their patience is to get that done. Thanks, Mayor, uh, for those comments. If, if I could also add in, I 
I think this is so true. Um, and it's also the opportunity of the supportive housing services measure that is so different than the opportunity of the affordable housing bond. Mm -hmm. The first voter approved measure was capital funding to create new buildings. And you're probably aware of some that are coming. Um, there's one that's opening in Tigard right now. I'm not sure if there are other buildings coming into Alton soon, but you're right. It takes years for new housing of any kind, affordable or not, just market-based, to actually hit the streets and the community to feel that impact. But the difference with the supportive housing services measure, now that we've got these systems in place, as Heather was describing, that Arla voucher is basically the rent assistance tool in people's back pocket that they can go and convert any market rate rent on the market down to something that they can afford because it pays the difference between their income to what the rent in that apartment would be. It's like a housing choice voucher or a section eight voucher as you may have under heard it called before. Um, so this is fast act acting impact. Um, what we need is the capacity of the workforce, the hiring up of staff, the building out of these systems to, um, to make that capacity um, to help that capacity reach our community. So I think the limitations in our first year of the SHS program is gonna be the availability of market rate units. I'm hearing from case managers every day that it's hard to find a one bedroom apartment in Washington County. Yeah. And to staff hiring people to take in on these new jobs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have fun finding a one bedroom apartment in Tualatin that's uh, vacant, that's for sure. On, on the uh, hotel front, refresh my memory, for the three hotels that were bought to run the programs, were they bought out of this pot of money or the uh, the metro uh, housing bond money? Sure. Um, so this measure is like, if you think about it, kind of like a levy. It's the mm -hmm. operations. Right. Um, so the capital investments have been made with other resources. Okay. The LOA Inn was purchased with the housing bond and the... Uh, Kana Lodge and the um, Forest Grove Inn um, were both purchased with um, state funding, I think, through Project Turnkey. But all three are being operated with the Supportive yeah. Housing Services yep. Program. Right. right. Other questions? Okay. I think that's it. Jess and Heather, thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate the update, and we look here. We look forward to hearing. Uh, more or maybe next few months. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you for your work. And we look forward to partnering with you as we continue to grow up this program. Okay, thank you. All right, that brings us to the second item on our work session. Uh, the, uh, let me scroll back up. I know what it is, but I just wanna give it the right title. I know it's Jerry and Ice Age Tourism and our Ice Age folks. Uh, yeah, so the Twalton area, area Ice Age Floods Foundation update and led by Jerry Ann. And I know, I'm um, assuming Scott's there somewhere and Yvonne. Welcome, yes, Jerry Ann. Hello. Uh, looks like Scott hasn't signed on quite yet. I'm expecting okay. him any second now, but we'll get started um, and he can join in as he's available. Uh, as you said, I'm Jerry Ann Thompson. You may know me as the library director for the city, but tonight I'm here to speak to you as the secretary of the Tualatin Area Ice Age Foundation. So I'm gonna share my screen for a short presentation. Give me just a moment. All right, hopefully everybody can see that okay. All right, so first to tell you who we are. We are a local group uh, formed here in Tualatin a few years ago with the purpose of supporting the um, Ice Age floods history and tourism in our area. Uh, seen on the, on the screen here are some of our board members. So starting from the left, we have Sylvia and Rick Thompson, who are from the Ice Age Floods Institute. Next is Yvonne Addington, former city manager for the city of Tualatin and vice president of our foundation. In the center is Scott Burns. He is the president for the foundation, and he is a professor emeritus of geology at Portland State University. Next is Linda Moholt. Formerly with the Chamber of Commerce here in Tualatin, she serves as our treasurer. Not pictured, and, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the gentleman on the right, but I believe he was from Skansa and he was involved in delivering the erratic rock that you see in the front of the picture. Not included in the picture, aside from myself, are Mike Full, 
who is with the Willamette Valley Pleistocene Project, and David Ellison from Woodburn High School. Um, you may have seen, he's got a huge buffalo in his classroom. They do excavations regularly there at Woodburn. Um, so they've gotten involved with our project as well. And that's why it's Tualatin area, because we are looking at a broader, the broader impacts of um, the Ice Age floods within Tualatin. All right, to give you a little bit of background, hopefully you all had a chance to watch the video uh, that we presented about the, um, the Ice Age floods and the local impact. Uh, but this all relates back to the Ice Age and you may have heard of the Ice Age floods or the Missoula floods. Uh, so there was a, uh, an ice dam in, in Montana near Missoula. And when that ice dam broke, it created these massive floods Scott would do a much better job of, of explaining this than I will, but I'll do my best. It, it created these massive floods that went all the way across Idaho, Washington State, and Oregon. And here on the screen, you can see uh, the, the path of those floods. They created many, many landforms in the states of, of Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, including the channeled scab lands in Eastern Washington, the Columbia River Gorge here in Oregon, and, um, and other geological features. And then the floods went all the way out to the Pacific Ocean, feeding out into uh, Astoria. This shows the picture of the Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail, which is the first national geologic trail to be formed by the National Park Service in the United States. Uh, it was founded a few years ago with the concept being that there would be uh, visitor centers throughout the, the path of the Ice Age floods. You can see uh, a couple of different trail routes that people would be able to visit throughout these different states and, and see different aspects of the legacy of the Ice Age floods here in our community. We are part of the Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail here in Tualatin. In fact, we were the first partner agency to sign on with the National Park Service as part of this trail. This trail is going to be promoted nationally and you will see uh, brochures like you see at other national park sites. And um, this is where we come in. So we are very interested in having a visitor center here in Tualatin. You're gonna hear more about that in a few minutes. Uh, as I said, our vision is to have a visitor center here in Tualatin as part of the National Park Service and the Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail. Currently, the Tualatin Library is serving as the interim visitor center. So within the library, we have, of course, our mastodon skeleton on display. We also have a display area set aside in partnership with the Tualatin Historical Society. And we've, we've displayed items both from the Historical Society and from the Willamette Valley Pleistocene Project, including fossils and replicas of fossils. There is a, a mastodon footprint, excuse me, a mammoth footprint replica within the library. There's a replica of the mastodon's tusk and the mastodon's tooth. Uh, there's also a actual real tusk from a mammoth uh, on display here in the library, as well as some small erratic rocks and fossils from other animals, including some that were dug up in the uh, Woodburn High School project. In addition, Tualatin has many trail and park features that are devoted to the Ice Age floods. And on the screen, you can see part of the uh, Tualatin River Greenway Trail, the most recent um, part of the trail that was developed a few years ago that runs behind New Seasons and Cabela's. It has a beautiful inlaid blue glass, which represents the Ice Age flood. And you can see how that flood expanded and grew over time as there were several floods that happened during the, uh, during the Ice Age floods period. And Scott, if you're there, feel free to jump in at any time. I am here. Okay, great. I'll let you take over. Oh, well, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I thought we were on at 610, so, but I'm here. So uh, thank you, Jerry Ann. You did, have done a wonderful job so far. Uh, our goals, first of all, I'm an educator. Jerry Ann's an educator, uh, is to get every kid in the region, not only in the Tiger Tualatin area, but all the uh, Southern uh, Portland area to come out and see and learn about the, the natural 
uh, history that we have got and the, the native peoples that we had in the area here. And awareness for this natural history uh, is very, very important. Next. Uh, and then here are a couple pictures of some of the fossils that we have. David Ellickson on the right-hand side from down in Woodburn, Mike Full uh, from uh, out in McMinnville, uh, both of them having fossils underneath Tualatin, potentially. We have a lot more fossils like the Mastodon that we have got. And we will have many of these in the visitor center. We already have them in the library. Next one. And then our main, main goals, we have four major goals. One of them is learning about the native people who lived here first, the, the Kalapuya uh, band especially. Next one. And so in the visitor center, we will have four major themes. First of all, the big picture of the Missoula floods in the Pacific Northwest, all uh, 16,000 square miles of them. But then uh, more specifically, the Portland area and the South Portland area. We entitled this whole video, um, Tualatin Crossroads of the Ice Age Floods because each of the 40 floods came through Tualatin to fill up the Tualatin Valley and then came back through here uh, as the water went back out into the ocean. So, uh, and so locally, what was it affected? It affected all the topography that we have in the area. The native people that we had in the region, that is going to be very, very important, as you noticed in the, the video that we had. And then large animals that were living in the area. Next one. And so our real request to you, the city council, is we want to partner with the city of Tualatin. We're proud of Tualatin and its history, and we want Tualatin to be proud of us. We have a natural history here that is incredible. We want not only the kids, but all the people living in the area and all of the visitors that are going to be coming into this area to understand all of this. We thank you for the tax dollars that you passed along to us to support our video. Uh, and, and so thank you. So that's why we're making the presentation tonight. It is more of just an awareness uh, that we are here and we are here to support Tualatin and the whole population, not only here, but all those that will be visiting. So if anybody has any question or comment, we would love to hear them. And I just wanted to share um, the video that we shared with you was paid in part with transient lodging tax dollars uh, through the city of Tualatin. The Tualatin, city of Tualatin gave um, $16,500 towards the cost of the video, which cost about $28,000 to produce. Thanks, Jerrianne and Scott. Good to see you, Scott. Good to uh, see you, questions for Jerrianne and or Scott. I see Linda Moholt there too. Hey, Linda. <laughs> uh, Councilor Pratt. I had it unmute. Oh, hi, Jerrianna, Scott. Uh, this is really exciting. I was in, um, um, just a little story here, but I was in Spokane a couple years ago and I was shocked that they had Ice Age Tonkin Trail stuff. And I thought it was just us. So <laughs> it's pretty exciting that it's all over this region. Um, I'm wondering if um, you guys work with the Historical Society and how you collaborate with them. And the answer is yes. And in fact, recently we just, move one of the boulders. I think Jerry Ann maybe showed you a picture of that, the, uh, the rhyolite boulder that we found over at, at Lake Ridge Middle School. And we moved it and it, it's right outside the Heritage Center, which is run by the Historical Society. So we work hand in hand with the Historical Society. This is more natural history as opposed to history. But, but then also the native peoples, that is, is history history. So, um, so we do. And they have been supportive of us. And we and the new plaque just went in this week for the Lake Ridge Rhyolite Boulder. And we split the cost with the Historical Society. Other questions for Karen or Scott? Councilor Sacco. I don't have a question, but I watched the video and it was so well done and so informative and I learned so much. So thank you very much for all your hard work. It's, it's much appreciated. Thank you. And that video, we're, we wanted to show it to you first before we debuted it on a, a broader scale because the city did help support it. Um, so it is our plan to release that video and make it available for the public to view. We do also plan in the future to show it within uh, inside the library. Councilor Reyes. Yes, um, thank you. Very 
interesting. Thank you very much. And Scott, I've seen you before at Rotary Club and you presented on the on the uh, floods. Um, and I just enjoy listening to to this, but I know you have other, um, I would say not stories, but historical uh, accounts that you 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 have done. And um, the Missoula floods are one of my favorite because I just feel like, because I live here in Tualatin, I just connect very well with that with that part of our history. So thank you very much for coming and um, presenting and talking to us. And I love the video. Well, thank you. And, uh, yeah. and I'm a big member of Rotary. In fact, we have a big Rotary meeting coming up tomorrow. And I love talking. I talk to many of the Rotary clubs. In fact, here in the Pacific Northwest, we live in a veritable wonderland of natural history. Wherever you go, the Mother Nature is shouting out to us. And there's a story that is there. And, and it, what I love to do is try and unlock those stories, whether it's at the coast or in the mountains or at our national park or in the gorge or wherever it is. There are so many stories that are there. We in Tualatin have got an incredible set of stories here, too, related not only to the floods. We could get into the origin of the bedrock. We could get into our little fault that we have running through the town that uh, Mayor Frank probably is not interested in hearing about. But, uh, uh, but still, there are a lot of stories that are here that I just want people to open up their eyes and wherever they go, they will see a story and what is it? And so, so that's what I enjoy being on this. We, our council that we have uh, with the Toilet Nice Age Flood Foundation is dynamic. I mean, every one of our meetings, we get a lot of neat things done and we're excited about uh, our vision. And we tried to show you the vision tonight. Yeah, I have heard the one also with the fault. Um... Down on the coast, at the, uh, when I was with the Red Cross, you did a tour and you took us, we went to this, um, the where the Portland City Grill is at, and I think we looked over, and it was kind of scary to hear about that, but, about <laughs> earthquakes and all that, but thank you. I just enjoy your talks. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. So happy to have you here. Thank you. Other We're very questions. fortunate to have Scott involved in this project. Yes. Other questions or comments? Oh, I've I've got a few. <laughs> uh, very much enjoyed the video. I think I thought it was very well done. Uh, I got a couple notes I put here. First thing when they started talking about coolies, I'm like I've always heard about the Grand Coulee Dam. I was like, what the heck is a coolie? So Scott, you made me have I made myself look it up. <laughs> what the definition of a coolie is, and uh, this is what I, I came up with that it's a deep ravine, a valley, or a drainage zone. Um, because there was a, quite a bit about that in the video. So that was one big uh, education moment for me. I was astounded by your um, enthusiasm and on the video and just wondering, did you use cue cards or all that stuff was in your head? That you no, just... I never, I never use notes. So I just, <laughs> it, it, it's all amazing. upstairs. The problem is, as you get older, you forget everything. And Frank, I would be right <laughs> in the middle of a lecture and I can't remember the word Felspar. And you go, oh no. <laughs> So I just zoom on by, and right. and uh, sometimes I miss some of the major things, but uh, um, it, it's upstairs, and uh, yeah. So it, it also shows because now and then you may stumble on something, and and they but nice. It, our videographer who put the whole thing together actually put things together so it didn't look that bad. I they did a terrific job. I love the uh, aerial drone vid uh, footage. Yeah, that was very well done. I thought it was uh, very informative. It was not overwhelming. Um, and then what I also thought was kind of cool is how you explain where all these names came from in like the Columbia Gorge about Rooster Rock and all the stuff, how they formed and where their names came from. And uh, I also like learned a lot more about erratics than I ever knew <laughs> <laughs> from that video. And I liked uh, how you guys took on the issue you know, how do you know all this? How can you prove this? And you guys uh, answered that in the video. I thought that was very well done. And uh, I thought Yvonne did a great job in the video also, uh, telling what's going on. And I really like that, even though it's Tualatin and focused, how you brought in other cities into the video, the surrounding cities. So I thought that was well done. So all in all, I think it's a great video for, to get out to people. Uh, it's educational, it's entertaining. And you learn a lot about the history of this area that, you know, having lived here for 20 plus years, I didn't know half this stuff. And it's kind of cool. And I hang around with Yvonne all the time. <laughs> I've heard lots of presentations from you, Scott, but I keep learning more. 
Yep. Well, and one of the things that really excited me when we were doing this, when they were videotaping me along the river, Paul Hannon came by. And, and, and so he's with the city. And, and yeah. so we said, Paul, we need to get your vision at, because he was working with the city. And, and his clips in that are phenomenal because it showed here is a city of Tualatin saying, we have something that a lot of other places don't have. And we want to take advantage of this. And, uh, and the city has done that. And I think that that is absolutely wonderful because a lot of other cities along the, the flood pass have done zip, but Tualatin mm -hmm. has. That's why we are located here. Yep. And I, you got you got passionate supporters. Uh, Linda's always talking about everybody she meets, as is Yvonne. I know the Chamber's also interested in being you know participating in this as well as, well as the Historical Society. And you know, with the economy coming back slowly but surely, you know, we might have some more, you know, transient lodging taxes to help develop this and attract more attention to this. And I know Jerry Ann does a great job with education and getting the message out to kids in the community. So uh, I think any help you need from us in pub publicity and like that, please let us know. And we will do that. And we just wanted to get the council aware of what's happening with us. And we have a dynamic board and, and we live in a town that is just, a lot of neat things happening and it will a lot more in the future too. So thank you. I saw Linda's hand up there. But since she's on the board, you know, I'll let her talk. <laughs> thank you. Hi guys. Nice to see you this evening. I'm sorry. I missed a little bit of it because I thought we were on at 610. So my apologies. Um, I know that you, you guys understand that the, the economic opportunity with this work is significant for Tualatin. And it was always our hope that as we work towards this um, Ice Age Interpretive Center, that it would help bring people to our community, great for the hotel, hospitality, restaurant industries. And um, we just see this as a long-term educational opportunity and economic opportunity. And we ha couldn't have the, any better leadership than Scott and Yvonne and Paul Hennen and Sylvia and Rick Thompson and all of the gang and Jerry Ann. And I mean, this is, this is a pretty significant movement of brain talent in our community. So if anybody is really wondering to get involved with the rocks or relics, let us know because we would love to make room for another person. So thank you for your tremendous support. We could not have done this work without the city's generous um, tourism dollars. So it's greatly appreciated. And I want you to know it wasn't wasted. We got a first class product thanks to your support. So well done, guys. Great effort. Mayor, this is Yvonne Addington. Hey, Yvonne. Just to, to pass on my uh, two feelings, I've been dealing with this uh, relic of yours that is in the library for over 40 years. And it's so sometimes all alone. It is so good to get such a wonderful group of people together to do, this summer we did four projects. And I'm so proud of the city of Tualatin, which is I-5, I-205, and has a lot of possibilities for economic development. So thank you all for helping. Okay, thank you. And as I said, you did a great job on the video, Yvonne. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions or comments for the group? Go ahead, Scott. Yes, just one last thing. Uh, uh, I just wanted to volunteer my services for the city of Tualatin because I'm a certified engineering geologist. I was on the state board and cities sometimes have to make decisions and, and hire consultants. I'm free. I live here in Tualatin. I've lived here for 32 years. Uh, I played my first football game 50 years ago here. And uh, uh, but so I, I'm a free consultant for Lake Oswego, West Lynn, uh, Wilsonville, uh, Tigard and Tualatin. So if, if any of the guys on your staff need help from a certified engineering geologist, I'm here. I'm sure Sherilyn's writing that down. <laughs> I right. mentioned one of the names that were left out sure. of the people that are constantly helping us. It's Brian Clopton of Clopton Excavating. He's the one that's bringing all those huge multi-ton rocks over here to Tualatin some from Gaston. He worked on Scott's project over in Lake Oswego, but he's very interested and helpful to the city of Tualatin all the time. 
When you see him, thank him for his efforts. Because, yeah, those things are not light. And I know when you placed the last one, it took uh, some serious machinery to bring it over here. That was only four tons. And the big, <laughs> big, biggest one is 10 tons that we brought from Gaston. It's amazing. Yeah, that those things just uh, were pushed by water that far, that fast. It was amazing. That's true. They were in melting icebergs. Yep. All right. An another thing, this is Sylvia Thompson. Hey, Sylvia. Another thing is that that rhyolite erratic, the newest one, brought national and international media attention to Tualatin because it was carried not just locally, but it the news story went national and also international. I was really surprised to see it. Uh, published in Borneo, had to look up where the heck Borneo was, and I suppose they were looking up where Tualatin was. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, pretty excited for the video to be debuted, I guess, in the coming days. Um, I very much appreciate the sneak peek. I uh, should be proud of the product, and we'll continue to partner with you on this project. Thank you for your support. You're welcome. Keep Thank, you. Work. Thank you. Thank you. Right. All right. So that brings us to our third item on the agenda, which is our council meeting agenda review, communications and roundtable. Uh, tonight, I think we're up to Valerie for the pledge. Right. And then I'll take care, since Bridget is in here, I'll take care of the uh, COVID-19 remembrance. And then I don't believe we have any proclamations. Let's scroll through here. Nope, so no proclamations. Any questions on the consent agenda tonight? All right, I guess we're okay there. So with that, we'll get to our round table and I'll start with on my right is Councilor Saka. Thank you. Um, so I only attended one meeting over the last few weeks. Um, I attended an I-205 I tolling meeting um, in Oregon City, and uh, it was an informational meeting, and I learned a lot, but some highlights. Um, so we're going to be starting um, some work uh, on the um, Abernathy Bridge, and that's where the um, the construction project will start. And just some highlights, um, there will be weekend closures. And they are having, um, they're working on a pretty large communication plan. So I guess as that, that rolls out, I think we all really need to be aware of, um, of that. And then um, another highlight, uh, interesting thing that I wasn't aware is that once they do start, start tolling, they do have no plans of stop stopping the tolling. Um, that'll just continue. Um, and I wasn't aware of that. And that was um, just, you know, um, a point that I think that people expect there to be an end. Um, I expected there to be an end. And so I, I do, um, you know, hope that as we do get more information that we do push it out to um, our community as much as possible. Um, and I just thought that there was, uh, there's a lot to impact Walletton. And I, I did reach out to Sherilyn, we talked about um, you know, making sure that the important um, groups in our community are getting some face time with the, that communication group that is going around um, to make sure that um, like our chamber and our, our, our groups, our community are aware of, of all of these things that are happening because I think it's going to be a huge impact on our community, as you all know. Um, that was it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Reyes. Uh, no meetings this last two weeks, but a lot this week, <laughs> so uh, um, next year. But thank you, um, everyone. Uh, no meetings from any, I didn't attend any meetings on behalf of the city this week, in the last couple of weeks, so thank you. But there are more to come. All right, thank you. Council Pratt. Hi, um, I attended a couple of things. First, we had for the, our climate action plan, we hadn't met with the actual person doing the public outreach. And so we had a, another meeting with um, JLA group. And um, I, 
we were like just more further impressed with them. So we're really happy we're moving forward with the group VR. Um, I went to a C4 meeting and um, our favorite subject tolling from ODOT was the topic. Um, they had in their presentation, I kind of beat up on Garrett because um, they were kind of bragging about the outreach they were doing to all the communities and they had every city affected listed but Tualatin. So <laughs> Cheryl is helping uh, with that. He was, yeah, right? <laughs> so anyway, so hopefully they'll be coming and speaking to us in the next couple of months. Um, the C4 committee, um, you know, everybody on that group, as you can imagine, is opposed to the tolling, but specifically they have big concerns about just tolling the 205 corridor and all the effects and the traffic diversion. And there's people in West Lynn and Oregon City that, you know, just to go to the grocery store, it's on and off the freeway. So they're gonna get charged every time they go to the grocery store. So um, we um, agreed to send a letter. Um, what was it, Cheryl, in the other group? It was the transportation committee. Someone, I'm so sorry, I can't remember. It's not ODOT, it's the transportation committee was taking comments. The OTC, Oregon Transportation Commission. Yeah, so C4, we all agreed to, except for Paul Savas, who says there should be no tolling, but we know that's not probably a reality, but so the gist of our letter was, if you're going to toll, you have to do the whole corridor. You can't pick this one section because it's going to have very negative effects um, on equity and everything else, and yeah, you're so right, Kristen. This, this is... Um, this is how ODOT is planning to help fund the roads going forward. So it's not an ending process. And then last but not least, last two weekends, and I know the mayor did this, and I know Sherilyn was out there, and I know Cindy was out at the park, but we did the holiday lights parade, and it was so much more fun than they expected. Just great holiday cheer for everybody involved. And someone had a bubble machine last week, which was super fun too. All right. Council President Grimes. I have no updates at this point. All right, thank you. Uh, as usual, a few meetings for me. Uh, as Councilor Pratt just mentioned, uh, participated in the last two parades. Uh, I want to thank uh, Julie and Heidi and all the city staff who helped coordinate this and also stand out in the pouring rain with their you know, directional flashlights, getting all the cats herded into uh, the parking lots and get them all ready to go out. Especially want to thank the police department. Uh, our three motorcycle police officers are out there making sure the route is safe, blocking traffic, and sometimes blinding you as they drive by you with the red and blue lights flashing in your eyes. <laughs> you lost all night vision at that point. You try, got to refocus, but a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank the Parks and Rec folks. They uh, asked me to do a video recording for promoting our next phase of the Veterans Memorial, which is going to be the design phase. So the city is going to do a marketing piece and promote the beginning of the design phase, which will start and begin in 2022. Uh, the Veterans Memorial will be uh, quite a bit of public feedback, input on what they want the memorial to look at to look like based on the criteria that we set. On the 9th, uh, the MMC had their meeting, spent a majority of our time uh, crafting a letter supporting the eviction protections legislation that's going through right now, the special session, because uh, the 60 days isn't cutting it. Uh, more, we need the 90 days and more money into the state coffers or transferring some money to pay for the rental assistance because it's pretty much tapped out. Uh, the remainder of the meeting was uh, from PG. Uh, ch chairperson of uh, the board, Maria Pope, gave a presentation with an update on PG's efforts, uh, what they're doing recently, and their big focus going to the future of electronic vehicles, electric vehicles, and rolling out more charging stations and the like to get more and more folks into electric vehicles. Uh, on the 10th, the Washington County mayors had their informal meeting. The whole meeting was was talking about COVID and how each of the cities are dealing with employees who do not want to be vaccinated or refuse to get vaccinated and also dealing with uh, city council meetings going in the future. Uh, doesn't sound like, uh, I think only one city council is going to meet in person uh, in the next coming few months. Everyone else is staying the course in Zoom like we are. 
uh, until things change drastically um, with the indoor mask mandate and the different uh, deviations of the COVID. Uh, no one feels like it's you know any time soon that we're going to meet in person and that we don't want to have to do that and get anyone ill. Uh, on the night, uh, was this on the ninth? Uh, GPI, the Small Cities Consortium, they gave a review of the wins and losses of opportunities in the region. Uh, we spoke at great length at a lot of companies coming into the area and say like I'll pick on Basalt Creek our new urban renewal zone that they like that there's, you know, like 40, 50 acres sitting there. What they don't like is it's just raw land. When they want to move here, they want to come to something that's ready to go. They want the infrastructure to be there. They want the flat um, land. They want the uh, foundation, not the foundation, what do you call it? The uh, basin on it, the slab to be there. Uh, they want pretty much, you know, classic shovel ready pro, um, projects. We're losing out to cities around the area because we don't have that infrastructure. So there's quite a bit of discussion of why and how we can get that kind of funding, either low interest loans or loans in lieu of SDC fees, because plenty of cities are more than interested in building out and getting that infrastructure in to uh, grab another LAM research or something like that. Uh, but you know, as you all know, you're in the budget committee. We don't have the money to pay for it. We can't build out, you know, Basalt Creek on our own, uh, so we're going to need some assistance. So uh, there's going to be just some discussion about talking to Metro. The legislature passed uh, a bill a couple, three years ago with a program that was supposed to be designated to help us with something like this, but it was never funded. <laughs> so it went to Oregon Business. There's a whole, there's a name for the program. I'm forgetting it, but there's zero dollars to help, you know, cities build out infrastructure. Uh, so it was quite a bit of discussion between uh, City of Tualatin and Wilsonville EDs, economic development folks, on uh, you know maybe revitalizing, getting that conversation going with the legislature and getting some money into that program. So we'll be following up on that. Um, today was the Washington County coordinating meeting and a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, the big thing, I sent you the PowerPoint slides of the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking process from DLCD. Whole bunch of discussion about their rules regarding parking and public transit. Uh, long story short, they wanna get rid of cities public, uh, how do I put this the right way? They, they want people out of cars. They want more people on bike, ped, and public transportation. And they want to eliminate cities' ability to require parking in any kind of development. That the, develop, the parking should be dealt with by the developer because the developer knows how much parking is needed. And that's what we'll go with. So there's you can imagine how the mayors took that. Uh, one of the things that they propose is that if you live Anything within a half mile of a transit line, there could there be no parking required. Uh, and you can imagine again, the, the mayors are losing their minds on this about you know how are we going to deal with that. And also, I I chimed in about you know how much I love TriMet and their lack of service here in town, and uh, how how are we going to get people in the buses when the buses don't go east west, when the buses are primarily focused north south. And they're just basically to get you into Portland, where if I need to go Oregon City, it doesn't work. And that, you know, even our ride connection service doesn't serve the whole community. I mean, there's, they want people to be able to get in a bike, uh, walk, or get in a bus so they can go to Fred Meyer. And, you know, so all those vehicle trips don't happen. But if we don't have that capacity out there, um, we're struggling. So uh, I've asked, I sent an email, and you saw an email that, we might want to have another up update on this because the rulemaking process is proceeding. They got beat up pretty good today, <laughs> but they're still accepting public comment. And uh, Mike, our transit guy, sent me some terrific questions and some of his concerns that we need to address. Um, the MSTIP, uh, remember we talked about we had the presentation about the equity framework. They have selected a consultant. It's uh, espousal strategies and Fabio Casas gave the presentation on how Washington County is going to proceed with their equity framework and city engagement plan. They'll be rolling this out 
uh, fairly quickly. Uh, we'll hear more from them in the coming month or so, but uh, they're moving full force with that kind of, remember we had all those questions about how are you going to define equity? What is equity? How are you going to go reach into our community? There, so they're putting that framework together right now. And going back to Valerie's comments and uh, Councillor Sacco's comments, the very end, it was beat up on ODOT time on um, tolling. <laughs> uh, Ryan Winsheimer was beat up like one believe about the poor job that ODOT is doing in educating the public and letting people know what's going on with tolling that we told them they need to step up their game because they're doing a very poor job. There's so much opposition to this and very little support and they're ignoring that fact that they speak in generalities and have very little specifics when questioned on it. And one of the, one of the mayors asked them, is this a revenue tool? Is this a, is this a congestion management tool or is it both? And you still can't tell us what the answer is on that. So how do you expect to support you know, tolling? So it was a, as usual, the Washington County Coordinating Committee is a very exciting meeting to attend. <laughs> it's not usual boring ones because you have, you know, all the Washington County mayors, uh, you know, supporting their communities and asking the tough questions that, you know, that Metro comes walking in with and ODOT and some other agencies. And, you know, we want the answers because we want to make sure our communities are supported. And, you know, we don't want to be, have terrible impact on our community or Portland centric development standards put on us. So um, I very much enjoyed those meetings, <laughs> as you could tell, because, you know, it's, uh, we, you know, there's no whole, there's no bars held. We, we ask the tough questions and uh, the presenters know they're going to have a tough time and they, you know, they heard uh, DLCD listen to us. And uh, one of the things I'm going to reach out to Mike is they want, uh, a couple more specifics on some of his concerns. I'll reach out to Cheryl and Mike about that tomorrow uh, about uh, what he sees as some problems with the rulemaking that will how it impact uh, Tualatin. I think that's it. I've got a dry mouth now. <laughs> Anything else uh, before we got a little break here? All right, with that, uh, looks like it's 637. We'll uh, end this work session. We'll start back up with our regular city council meeting in about 23 minutes. <laughs>